make sure I stick to time. So thanks, Vicki. Um, as I said, I'm Lucy Havens, and I'm presenting um, work done as part of my PhD research with Rachel Hosker, Ben Bach, Melissa Terrace, and B. Alex, titled Collaboration Across the Archival and Computational Sciences to Address Legacies of Gender Bias in Descriptive Metadata. So we're presenting this work as a case study done with the Scottish Archives, and we approach this work from mainly American and European perspectives. Um, so while there have been major advances in machine learning systems, I'm sure a lot of people have been hearing about uh, large language models lately with the release of ChatGPT, there are some pretty serious limitations with these systems when it comes to social biases. So whether it's a chatbot like ChatGPT or a facial recognition al algorithm or a search engine, um, there's been a lack of critical data set curation and model design that has led to social biases being engineered into these systems, to borrow a term from Ruha Benjamin. Now, you might ask, kind of, what's the big deal with this? Well, these social biases end up causing um, a lot of harms and sometimes even not just perpetuating, but amplifying harms to groups who are already experiencing marginalization. So this could be things like the sexualization of women, the criminalization of black people, the erasure of trans people, among many other examples. So in response to some of these harms that have been surfacing as these technologies have become more widely used, there's been an explosion of research in the computational sciences about bias and fairness and related areas. And so you've got conferences like the Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, or workshops at those conferences, like one about gender bias and natural language processing that have really encouraged a lot of academic research in these areas. And then there's also been growing public awareness of some of the, the limitations of these systems, thanks to books like Weapons of Mass Destruction and documentaries like Coded Bias. Um, but even kind of given all this work and attention on the topic, there still has been quite kind of limited progress um, on really meaningfully mitigating these harms um, from these bias systems. So the reason for that, we argue, is that there's been a kind of standard top-down approach in machine learning. And while there are some exceptions, in general, this has caused a prioritization of things that are obstructing progress on the issue of bias. So specifically, there's been a prioritization of quantity over quality, prioritization of uh, convenience over representativeness, of efficiency over accuracy, and of universal thinking over situated thinking. So we take a step back in our work and are finding fault and limitations with some of the underlying assumptions of this approach, um, largely around the way that these prioritizations have led bias to be approached as a problem that has a fix, um, and the way that technologies end up getting built with the aim of being objective or neutral in, in too many cases. So we focus instead on you know, acknowledging that all knowledge is going to be partial, all data is partial and situated. So rather than trying to remove biases, how can we make them more transparent so that the perspectives in a data set or a technology system are more obvious in terms of what's been included, and then it makes it easier to figure out what perspectives have been excluded. So we reverse the top-down approach and prioritize quality over quantity, representativeness over convenience, accuracy over efficiency, and situated thinking over universal thinking. Part of the situated thinking is about positioning our work as a case study. So we've been working with the archives catalog at the University of Edinburgh's Heritage Collections, where descriptions in the catalog are written in British English. Um, and we're focusing particularly on gender bias. Due to the complexities of bias, we felt kind of within the timeline of my PhD, taking on bias overall was, uh, was not going to be feasible. The archives itself, to give you kind of a brief idea, has a really wide array of material. Um, you get things like slides, drawings, illuminated manuscripts, letters, um, field notes, lecture notes, among, among many other things. And the descriptions of these items don't all have dates, unfortunately, but the ones that do, um, some of the oldest date back to the 19th century, and new descriptions are still being written today. So those descriptions make up kind of the data set that we are investigating, and we came up with three research questions to guide our work. So the first being, 
Can humans reliably annotate gender bias language in the descriptions? Secondly, can machine learning models be taught to automate that annotation process so it could be scaled up? And thirdly, how useful would such machine learning models be for catalogers, archivists, librarians, and curators? So through investigating these research questions, we've uh, come up with a number of contributions. So first, a taxonomy of gender bias language. Second, a data set manually annotated for gender biases. Third, machine learning models that are trained on that annotated data set to automate the detection of gender bias language. And lastly, an evaluation approach to the models that is interdisciplinary, brings together qualitative and quantitative approaches. So this is the online platform of the archives where we were able to obtain our data using um, a protocol called the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting, which allows you to obtain the metadata from the catalog in XML format for those who are interested in our encoded archival description, or EAD. And then from there, I turned that into plain text data. So it looks a little bit more like what you see on the screen now. So just to give you a sense, um, the main descriptions that provide kind of the most language in our data set are the scope and contents description and then the biographical and historical descriptions. And the length of the descriptions varies, so this is another example where you can see they're a bit shorter, and then yet another example as well. Um, to annotate gender bias, the kind of key step here was really clearly defining what we meant by gender bias language, which is something in kind of the machine learning community that has been um, kind of a widely cited limitation where definitions have been too vague. So we focused on two types of gender bias, the first being omission, which is about exclusions and silences and absences. To give a sense of what that looks like in the actual descriptive language, this is one example um, from a collection record where uh, the description reads, this group portrait of Lauren Saint, Polinaire, and Picasso, and his mistress. And so the key here is that the last person is being described in terms of somebody else rather than having their own identity. Another example that, <clears throat> excuse me, gets at the intersectional nature of bias is in this description where there's a Burmese family of three people who are unnamed. Um, described as having a, um, a condition where they have unusual hair growth. And the context of the record is really important here. This description appears within a collection um, called the Roslyn Slide Collection, which is largely pictures of animals. So here the, um, the bias is less about gender and it's more about colonialism, imperialism, ethnicity. So the second type of gender bias we look at um, is stereotypes. So this is about language that's kind of overly simplified, judgmental, limiting in a person's identity, um, kind of reinforcing societal power imbalances. And I'll give a couple examples of what this looks like. So there's one collection titled uh, Susan Binney Anderson, and in the description about her career, um, it says that she found it difficult to keep her medical career going and kind of implies that this is due to the fact that she was young, married, and had children. And then kind of ends by saying that although she tried to return and to her career as a doctor, this just wasn't to be, for the exact words. Um, and then another example of a stereotype is in the way um, marital relationships are often described. So here it says, Jewel took an active interest in her husband's work. Jewel here is referring to Florence Jewel Bailey. And while there is an omission um, where her husband, John Bailey, is referred to simply as her husband, the stereotype um, that I want to focus on here that's arguably more harmful is this assumption of the secondary role that Jewel played in this relationship. There's no room given in the description in the way it's worded for Jewel to have shared interests with her husband or potentially even have influenced her husband's interests in any way. So we took um, descriptions from the catalog like this and then hired several annotators uh, to work with me to apply labels in this way according to kind of more specific definitions um, of omission and stereotype and a few, other, a few other labels as well. And so what you can do once you have that labeled data is use a supervised machine learning process where we fed that data into what are called text classification models. 
And those models then aim to pick up on the patterns in those labels so that they can automate the annotation process. And the type of machine learning that we use is more like classical or traditional machine learning. So we're not using deep learning or sometimes that are called neural models here because those are larger models that are trained on different data sets that will have different biases than our own data set from this archival catalog. And so it becomes really difficult um, because at the moment there's no way to disentangle biases from a model in the data set it was trained on from biases from like, the actual data set where we're trying to measure bias. So then what we can do is have those classifiers be run on unannotated data and apply the labels themselves. And then we compare those models annotations to the human annotations of those same descriptions to get a sense for how well the model is performing the task that we laid out in identifying omissions and stereotypes. So there were two ways that we evaluated the models, um, and it goes back to this comparison, as I mentioned, of the human annotators agreement with um, a comparison of the models agreement with an aggregation of those human annotators agreements. So this is a quantitative evaluation approach. We use a typical machine learning metric called F1 score, where the worst score is zero, the best possible score is one. So what you can see on the slide at the top um, is for the model's performance with the omission label. And the top bar in that chart is showing our kind of final model, which we call the improved model. Um, and you can see relative to kind of one being the highest score, the model performs reasonably well. Um, additionally, if you compare it to the two different manual annotator scores, the bottom two bars of that chart, um, it falls kind of in between, but on the higher end. So again, this is pretty good um, for, for a text classification model. And then the bottom chart is showing the performance on the stereotype label, which is even better. So it's getting closer to that one highest possible score. And it also outperforms both of the manual annotators agreement scores. So in addition to this quantitative approach, as I mentioned, uh, we took a qualitative approach as well, which is quite unusual in machine learning, but we argue is really important. And um, especially when working with a task such as bias, it's very subjective, is something that um, is necessary and we really hope to see more of in this area. So the qualitative approach was a workshop conducted with 10 members of the Heritage Collections team, um, so the people that work with the, the archival material and the catalog that, that makes up our data set. There was a mix of catalogers, librarians, archivists, and curators represented. And we broke the workshop into two activities, initially focusing at the individual description level. So we talked about what our taxonomy was and then provided examples of that taxonomy applied to a few descriptions from the catalog. Um, and you might notice the taxonomy looks bigger here than just the two labels I've described. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I didn't want to go into too much detail, but I'll point out there's a publication at the end that has the full taxonomy if you're interested. And then the second part of the workshop, we took more of a high level view where we were looking at summary information that could be calculated using the output of the text classification models. So these were charts and tables. Um, and with both of these activities, we were asking people about whether they agreed with what they were seeing or whether they disagreed, whether they had questions about what they were seeing, and, and most importantly, what they would do with the information that they were being presented with on the worksheets. So to kind of summarize the output, there were um, a few key strengths that were identified with using machine learning models for this context. Um, the first being about collection reviews. So when there's a, a manual review of descriptions that have been written into a catalog to try to add context or correct inaccuracies um, from historical biases, that's so far been entirely manual. And so these models offer a way to help people who are tasked with that to prioritize which collections they're reviewing and figure out and which descriptions potentially in very large collections um, have been flagged as kind of the most potentially problematic if they have the most labels from, from the model. In addition to that, there was a discussion of how looking at what the model was identifying could guide 
best practices for volunteers um, who come in to support cataloging work, and also facilitate self-reflection just among the Heritage Collections team about kind of the tensions between our kind of standards and training that people often are kind of given um, with the what Rachel refers to as the kind of messy reality of, of archival records and material. The limitations that were identified during the workshop um, were around, first of all, the inevitability of bias. So with any classification or description, there will always be social biases, um, and that includes the taxonomy. So there are ways that we discussed how the way that certain labels were applied were actually reinforcing some social biases themselves. We also talked about the difficulty of tracing the origins of bias. So this work is not trying to point fingers at a single cataloger because there are so many different influences that um, are intertwined that it's impossible to say, you know, the bias comes from purely the material or purely the cataloger or, you know, the classification standards. It's all, um, it's all very intermixed. And then we also talked about uncertainty. So in some cases, you you can see that there might be gender bias, but you can't say for certain. Um, and so I think, again, this is where kind of taking more of a humanities approach where uncertainty is more um, kind of allowed for than, than machine learning, where everything is often split into kind of binaries, either it is or it isn't. Um, it's kind of very important when thinking about the limitations of some of these machine learning systems. So going back to the original problem, essentially what we found is that this bottom-up approach that we proposed is helping to make gender bias language more transparent. Um, thinking particularly about our audience, we did find that it was making, um, making the perspectives that were included and excluded in the descriptions more obvious to people. So to and summarize, we, with this bottom-up approach, prioritize quality by employing a small number of human annotators rather than crowd workers um, due to ethical concerns with crowd work, but also due to the value from annotators being able to have a discussion with one another about difficult annotation scenarios. We prioritize representativeness over convenience by working with models that were trained solely on the archival data that we were working with. We prioritize accuracy by asking the audience of our models to evaluate them in their own um, kind of in their own work context, as well as working with data that was solely again from our case study context. It didn't include other kind of commonly used machine learning text data sets that would have given us more data, but would have kind of muddied the waters when it comes to understanding what biases were actually in the archival catalog. And lastly, we prioritize situated thinking um, by presenting the work as a case study, by approaching bias as inevitable. Um, and I'll just close with a few recommendations that we've come with, we've come up with through all this work. So first for the kind of machine learning and computational sciences community, really consider where this bottom-up approach might be more appropriate, especially if you're working with subjective tasks. Um, and collaborate end to end, not just kind of in fits and starts, but through the entire model development process, starting with the data curation. For the GLAM sector, remember that there is value in your own approaches um, to, to thinking about data and text, even if you're not used to thinking about you know, catalog descriptions as data. Um, there's a lot of, there's a huge need to bring approaches from archival science and the wider gland sector, humanities, to machine learning work and the way that these tools are built. And then for historians and digital humanists, um, any visitor to, to a GLAM catalog, I, we would caution you against um, kind of falling into the hype around a lot of these machine learning tools. I think especially with ChatGPT, there's a lot going on right now. Um, and while there are some really great advances and they have you know, their uses, um, when it comes to social biases, there are still some very serious limitations. So these, these tools need to be approached with a critical eye. And typically, this is an audience that, that is more critical than the people who are developing the models and publishing them as state of the art. So I'll close there and say, if you are interested in seeing the full taxonomy, it's the middle paper on the slide that has the complete details. Um, and I will be publishing we will be publishing a paper in the future that has the classification models, the code, the data, so that's publicly available. So thank you for listening.